So my crazy idea is the Big Bang and a remote future, they seem completely different. One is extremely dense, extremely hot. The other is very, very rarefied and very, very cold. If you squash one down by this conformal scaling, you get the other. So although they look and feel very different, they're really almost the same. The remote future on the other side, I'm claiming is that, where do the photons go? They go into the next Big Bang. The mysteries of the universe have captivated us for centuries. From the depths of space to the smallest subatomic particles, we continue to uncover secrets that challenge our understanding of the universe through the James Webb Space Telescope, humanity's most powerful eye in the sky. In a growing series of triumphs, the telescope draws back the curtain on the early universe, unveiling breathtaking new views of the universe with a clarity that's never been seen before. Interestingly, this massive eye will be powerful enough to detect light from other universes. In other words, we can finally start to understand the true nature of our universe and whether or not there are an infinite number of parallel universes out there. Join us as we dig deep into how James Webb just changed everything we know about the cosmos. Today, when we look out at the universe beyond the limits of our Earth, a glorious and fairly comprehensive picture emerges. We know that our planet, like every other planet in the universe, is made of atoms. A gaseous atmosphere shrouds a solid center, which consists of the densest, heaviest atoms. Lighter layers float atop the denser ones, leading to an onion-like compositional structure for every planet, dwarf planet, and moon sufficiently investigated so far. Planets both float freely through the galaxy and also orbit stars, which fuse lighter elements into heavier ones in their cores. When a star runs out of fuel, its core contracts and heats up. If it gets hot and dense enough, the next set of elements in the chain will continue to fuse. Otherwise, the star transitions into a stellar remnant, gently in some cases and cataclysmically in others. On larger scales, the stars are grouped together into larger assemblages known as galaxies, with galaxies clumping together into groups, clusters, and even larger superstructures. All together, they form a structure known as the cosmic web, where galaxies are aligned along filaments, clustered together at the nexuses of those filaments, and where that structure is separated by great empty cosmic voids. That's what the universe is. However, if we want to know how it got to be that way, we have to apply the laws of physics to the universe and follow the evolution of the physical systems that we know exist. For instance, we know how gravitation works. We have the laws of general relativity that govern it. So wherever you have mass or energy, you have the phenomenon of gravitation. We know how electromagnetism works. Wherever you have an electrically charged object, whether moving or at rest, or an electromagnetic wave, the electromagnetic force comes into play. We know how the nuclear forces work, including how quarks and gluons bind together to make protons and neutrons, how protons and neutrons bind together to make atomic nuclei, and how unstable nuclei radioactively decay. And we know how to time evolve any physical system that we start off with. Put simply, if you give a physicist a set of initial conditions that describe your system, they can write down equations that govern the evolution of that system and can tell you to the limits of the uncertainty and indeterminism inherent to nature, what the outcome or probabilistic set of outcomes of that system will be at any point in the future. So where did it all come from then? Well, it makes sense to start with Earth teeming with complex, differentiated, and even intelligent life, with an atmosphere, oceans, and a layered interior with a crust, mantle, and outer and inner core. At a simple level, Earth is made up of atoms. At a more complex level, however, Earth is made of the full suite of atoms that comprise the periodic table, and primarily of iron, oxygen, silicon, magnesium, sulfur, nickel, calcium, and aluminum. 
This is interesting because these are overwhelmingly heavy elements as opposed to the lightest ones, hydrogen and helium. But hydrogen and helium, when we examine the cosmos, are everywhere. In fact, they're so abundant that they make up over 99% of the atoms in the universe. Fewer than 1% of the atoms out there, by number, are anything heavier. So in order to make a planet like Earth, made out of rocks, metals, ices, and complex molecules, you need to have some way to create these heavier elements and then to gather them together in one place in sufficient abundances in order to form planets. Fortunately, when we look out into the universe, we see the very processes that are required for this to occur in action. Inside stars, nuclear fusion occurs, building heavier elements up from lighter ones. Toward the ends of their lives, these stars, depending on their masses, become red giants, giving rise to novel nuclear processes that don't occur during most of their lives, develop strong winds, which can blow off significant fractions of the star's mass, can die in a planetary nebula, with the remnant core shrinking down to a white dwarf, can die in a core collapse supernova, with the imploding remnant becoming either a neutron star or a black hole. And those remnants, either white dwarfs or neutron stars, can later collide, triggering runaway reactions that create still greater abundances of heavier elements. This explains why, consistent with observations, we can find populations of stars where fewer generations have formed previously, like in the Milky Way's outer halo, and they have lower abundances of heavy elements. Similarly, there are populations of stars where greater numbers of generations of stars have formed, such as in the galactic plane, closer in toward the galactic center, and they have higher abundances of heavy elements. Additionally, we've recently directly imaged the disks that form around new stars, protoplanetary disks. Inside, we find gaps, clumps, and other evidence of the existence of young, newly forming planets. After generations of stars that lived and died, a new generation of stars, rich in recycled materials from previously dead generations, gave rise to planets including rocky ones with the ingredients for life. In fact, as we look farther back into the distant universe, we can see that it isn't just the abundances of heavy elements that evolve, but the galaxies themselves. Nearby, we find large spiral and elliptical galaxies, heavily grouped and clustered together, with low star formation rates, large masses, relatively low amounts of gas, and greater proportions of red stars than blue stars, overall. But as we look farther and farther away, we notice two primary differences in the galaxies we see. The farther away a galaxy is, the less evolved it is. Less massive, less clustered, with star formation that peaked some 11 billion years ago and has been declining ever since, gas-rich, with lower abundances of heavy elements, and with a greater relative abundance of blue stars to red compared to present-day galaxies. Additionally, the farther away a galaxy is, the more severely its light is systematically shifted toward longer wavelengths, a cosmological redshift. The second property, when you fold in general relativity, leads us to the conclusion that the universe is expanding. The expansion causes all light to exhibit a cosmological redshift as it travels through intergalactic space. So objects that are farther and farther away will possess a larger redshift, will appear to be moving away from us more quickly, and, perhaps most importantly, will be seeing them as they were a longer period of time ago, since light can only travel at a finite speed, the speed of light. But the fact that galaxies grow and evolve over time indicates something quite profound that if we can look back early enough, we might find a population of the first stars and galaxies, and beyond that, no stars or galaxies at all. If the universe is expanding, cooling, and becoming gravitationally clumpier over time, then that tells us that early on, the universe was smaller, denser, hotter, and more uniform than it is today. We can extrapolate things back using this logic and applying the appropriate physics as far as we care to go. 
When we do, we arrive at an extraordinary set of predictions. The universe will only develop structures, like galaxies, galaxy clusters, and the cosmic web, according to the rules of gravitational growth in an expanding universe. There will be an epoch where the first stars and galaxies form. Before that, there will only be pristine gas. Before even that, there will come a time where the radiation in the universe was so hot that the formation of neutral atoms would have been impossible, and so there should be a sign from when we formed stable neutral atoms for the first time. And finally, at even earlier times, it would have been too hot to form stable atomic nuclei, and so when we cool through that threshold, we should wind up with a specific set of abundances for the elements that form from fusion reactions in the early universe. These predictions have all been verified, along with an impressive number of others. We found a leftover background of microwave radiation just 2.7725 kelvins above absolute zero, consistent with the expected afterglow of a hot Big Bang. We've detected evidence for the first pristine clouds of gas and find that they're composed exclusively of hydrogen, helium, and a tiny amount of lithium. We've even indirectly detected the predicted leftover background of neutrinos and antineutrinos from their imprint on both the large-scale structure of the universe and the temperature imperfections in the cosmic microwave background. And we know, based on the observed facts of the universe, that it must have been born with the seeds of what would become its large-scale structure, an initial spectrum of overdense and underdense regions. What could have created those initial overdensities and underdensities? That's the brilliance of the theory of cosmic inflation. Not only would this be a mechanism for generating those seed fluctuations, and not only would inflation explain the universe's already observed properties, but it would make new predictions as to what those fluctuations ought to look like. Cosmic inflation posits that prior to the hot Big Bang, where matter and radiation filled the hot, dense, largely uniform and rapidly expanding universe, the universe was instead completely empty. Only instead of having no energy in it, it possessed a tremendous amount of energy inherent to the fabric of space. As the universe expands, more space is created, and so the energy density remains constant. As a result, the universe gets imprinted with the same properties everywhere. It gets stretched so that its curvature is flat, and the quantum fluctuations that normally pervade all of space on tiny scales instead get stretched by inflation to great cosmic ones. According to the theory of inflation, those fluctuations should create the seeds of the structure we have today, and they would have possessed the properties of being, of almost the same magnitude on all scales, generated on scales larger than the cosmic horizon, 100% adiabatic of constant entropy, and 0% isocurvature of constant spatial curvature. And it also predicts that the properties of the Big Bang's leftover glow should indicate a maximum temperature for the hot Big Bang that's substantially lower than the maximum possible temperature, the Planck temperature. Unfortunately, that's as far back as we can go with the understanding of the universe that we have today. Because of the nature of inflation, it by necessity wipes out any information that existed in the universe before it happened. In fact, we can only ever hope to access what occurred during the final 1032 seconds or so of inflation. Anything that occurred earlier will be inaccessible to us from here in our universe. Although we can state with confidence where our observable universe came from and explain the origin of a great many phenomena within it, the questions of where things like space, time, energy, or the laws of physics came from in the first place, or whether they even began at all, remain unanswered. As a result, scientists concoct a series of scenarios where new theories comes into play. Many of these scenarios are quite famous within the cosmology community and include such novelties as conformal cyclic cosmology. Roger Penrose was initially fascinated by the philosophical implications of the steady-state model in his early exploration of cosmology. This model proposed that the universe was boundless and infinite, and hydrogen was continually produced, enabling its expansion to persist indefinitely. 
The idea of an endless universe with an abundance of hydrogen was visually captivating. Nevertheless, the steady-state model was discredited when scientists applied Einstein's equation to cosmology, leading to the development of the Big Bang Theory. Both Penrose and Einstein favored an eternal universe, but the discovery of the microwave background provided evidence for the Big Bang Theory. Penrose acknowledged the limitations of the steady-state model and recognized the necessity of the Big Bang Theory, except for inflation, to make the equation work. Besides that, Roger Penrose also has put forward several fascinating ideas and perspectives about the universe, including his thoughts on cosmic inflation, the expansion of the universe, the role of black holes, and the eventual fate of the universe. Regarding cosmic inflation, Penrose explains that it is a theoretical concept in cosmology that attempts to explain the rapid expansion of the universe in the first few fractions of a second after the Big Bang. The idea proposes that during this period, the universe underwent a period of exponential growth, driven by a field known as the Inflaton field. This theory has helped explain various observations of the universe, such as its large-scale structure and the evenness of cosmic microwave background radiation. Penrose suggests that although inflation can account for certain features of the early universe, it fails to fully explain the low entropy of the universe during that time. As a result, he has presented his own theory, called conformal cyclic cosmology, which proposes that the universe experiences a succession of aeons, each starting with a big bang and concluding with a big crunch, leading to the universe eventually returning to a state of very low entropy. Moving on to the expansion of the universe, Penrose notes that Einstein initially believed the universe to be static until observing supernovae revealed that the universe is, in fact, constantly expanding. Penrose explains that as the universe expands, it becomes more and more isolated and boring, resulting in fewer and fewer interesting things happening. He predicts that eventually all the stars in each galaxy will burn out and there will be no new stars forming. As the black holes in each galaxy eventually merge together, there will be no new energy being created in the universe and it will become a dark, cold, and empty place. According to Penrose, black holes may be the most intriguing entities in the universe since they are not impacted by the expansion of the universe. These incredibly dense objects form when massive stars collapse and possess an immensely powerful gravitational pull capable of trapping even light. Due to their complex nature, black holes have challenged our knowledge of the universe and studying them could uncover more about the fundamental principles of physics. In addition, he suggests that black holes have the potential to consume everything in their vicinity, including entire clusters of galaxies, resulting in a universe comprised solely of black holes. This process will continue until all that remains are black holes that will eventually evaporate away due to a phenomenon called Hawking radiation. This hypothesis is not solely based on scientific evidence, but also reflects an emotional viewpoint on the universe. It is predicted that as the universe cools, it will become an empty and monotonous expanse with only photons remaining. However, since photons are relativistic in nature, they do not experience boredom or anything else. Ultimately, the universe will become an infinite void consisting only of mathematical concepts like infinity. Frankly, Penrose's theory addresses some of the problems with the standard Big Bang theory. These include, was the Big Bang really a singularity, a place of infinite density where the laws of physics break down? What caused the Big Bang? The horizon problem. Why do different regions of space, which haven't had time to come into contact with each other since the Big Bang, look the same? However, it is worth noting that even though the conformal cyclic cosmology addresses these questions, it doesn't mean it is correct. The mathematics behind Penrose's theory is consistent, but that doesn't mean that it reflects the real world. In other words, the conformal cyclic cosmology theory might be an abstract mathematical curiosity which bears no resemblance to reality. 
Anyway, a good scientific theory is one which makes predictions which can be experimentally tested. And if these predictions are fulfilled, the theory is supported. If not, the theory is falsified. For instance, the steady state theory in which the universe taken as a whole does not evolve or change over time was very popular in the late 1940s and 1950s is a good theory. The theory was shown to be incorrect in the 1960s when it became clear that the universe is changing. Even so, in the words of Stephen Hawking, the steady state theory was what Karl Popper would call a good scientific theory. It made definite predictions which could be tested by observation and possibly falsified. Unfortunately for the theory, they were falsified. Back to Penrose's theory, the general view is that no evidence has been found to support it. However, this does not necessarily mean the conformal cyclic cosmology theory is incorrect. It remains a possibility that some proof might exist, and we have to find out. Interesting. This can absolutely come true because we are living in a golden age of discovery like we've never seen before. Thanks to evolving technology, humans are able to look back in time to the moments just after the Big Bang, exploring the universe as never before. One of the most powerful instruments is the James Webb Space Telescope. Renowned as a time machine, James Webb was built to revolute our understanding of the root as well as the evolution of the universe. From our cosmic backyard in the solar system to distant galaxies near the dawn of time, the James Webb Telescope has delivered on its promise of revealing the universe like never before in its first year of science operations. Every new image is a new discovery, empowering scientists around the globe to ask and answer questions they once could never dream of. One of James Webb's goals is to catch galaxies in the act of forming during the universe's first billion years. The telescope's initial observations from last summer hinted at a young universe full of strikingly mature galaxies, but the information astronomers could wring from such images was limited. To really understand the early universe, astronomers needed more than just the images. They hungered for the spectra of those galaxies. The data that comes in when the telescope breaks incoming light into specific hues. Galactic spectra, which James Webb started to send back in earnest at the end of last year, are useful for two reasons. First, they let astronomers nail down the galaxy's age. The infrared light James Webb collects is reddened, or redshifted, meaning that as it traverses the cosmos, its wavelengths are stretched by the expansion of space. The extent of that redshift lets astronomers determine a galaxy's distance and therefore when it originally emitted its light. Nearby galaxies have a redshift of almost zero. The Webb telescope can handily make out objects beyond a redshift of five, which corresponds to roughly one billion years after the Big Bang. Objects at higher redshifts are significantly older and farther away. Second, spectra give astronomers a sense of what's happening in a galaxy. Each hue marks an interaction between photons and specific atoms or molecules. One color originates from a hydrogen atom, flashing as it settles down after a bump. Another indicates jostled oxygen atoms, and another nitrogen. A spectrum is a pattern of colors that reveals what a galaxy is made of and what those elements are doing. And James Webb is providing that crucial context for galaxies at unprecedented distances. As Ayush Saxena, an astronomer at the University of Oxford, said, We've made such a huge leap. The fact that we're talking about chemical composition of Redshift 9 galaxies is just absolutely remarkable. Galactic spectra are also perfect tools for finding a major perturber of atoms, giant black holes that lurk at the hearts of galaxies. Black holes themselves are dark, but when they feed on gas and dust, they rip atoms apart, making them beam out telltale colors. Long before Webb's launch, Astrophysicists hoped the telescope would help them spot those patterns and find enough of the early universe's biggest and most active black holes to solve the mystery of how they formed. And when James Webb stares at young galaxies, which appear as mere red specks in the darkness, 
it sees a surprising number with cyclones churning in their centers. The most straightforward explanation for the tornado-hearted galaxies is that large black holes weighing millions of suns are whipping the gas clouds into a frenzy. That finding is both expected and perplexing. It is expected because JAMS Webb was built in part to find the ancient objects. They are the ancestors of billion sun behemoth black holes that seem to appear in the cosmic record inexplicably early. By studying these precursor black holes, scientists hope to learn where the first humongous black holes came from and perhaps identify which of two competing theories better describes their formation. Did they grow extremely rapidly, or were they simply born big? Yet the observations are also perplexing, because few astronomers expected James Webb to find so many young, hungry black holes, and surveys are turning them up by the dozen. In the process of attempting to solve the former mystery, astronomers have uncovered a throng of bulky black holes that may rewrite established theories of stars, galaxies, and more. Most black holes are made when a very massive star burns through its fuel and then collapses under the weight of its own gravity. Stellar mass black holes are typically in the range of 5 to 100 times the mass of the Sun. In contrast, the supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies are much bigger. The black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, called Sagittarius a star, has a mass equal to about 4.3 million suns. But even that pales compared to the heaviest black hole known, Ton 618, found at the center of a quasar, weighs in at a staggering 66 billion solar masses. Just how these giant black holes were formed remains a mystery even today. While one idea is that individual stellar mass black holes combined, it is difficult to envision that there has been enough time since the universe began 13.8 billion years ago for enough mergers to have occurred to account for the observed distribution of supermassive black holes. And it's even harder to imagine that giant black holes formed early in the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope is able to image ancient galaxies, ones that existed a few hundred million years after the universe began. In a paper published in Nature Astronomy, astronomers combined a Webb observation with separate data from the Chandra X-ray Observatory to identify the most distant black hole yet seen. The research team found the black hole in a galaxy named UHZ1 in the direction of the galaxy cluster Abel 2744, located 3.5 billion light-years from Earth. Web data, however, has revealed the galaxy is much more distant than the cluster, at 13.2 billion light-years from Earth, when the universe was only 3% of its current age. Then over two weeks of observations with Chandra showed the presence of intense, superheated, X-ray-emitting gas in this galaxy, a trademark for a growing supermassive black hole. The light from the galaxy and the X-rays from gas around its supermassive black hole are magnified by about a factor of four by intervening matter in Abel 2744 due to gravitational lensing, enhancing the infrared signal detected by Webb and allowing Chandra to detect the faint X-ray source. This discovery is important for understanding how some supermassive black holes can reach colossal masses soon after the Big Bang. Do they form directly from the collapse of massive clouds of gas, creating black holes weighing between about 10,000 and 100,000 suns? Or do they come from explosions of the first stars that create black holes weighing only between about 10 and 100 suns? There are physical limits on how quickly black holes can grow once they've formed, but ones that are born more massive have a head start. It's like planting a sapling which takes less time to grow into a full-size tree than if you started with only a seed," said Andy Goulding of Princeton University, a co-author of the Nature Astronomy paper and lead author of a new paper in the Astrophysical Journal. Letters that reports the galaxy's distance and mass using a spectrum from Webb. The team has found strong evidence that the newly discovered black hole was born massive, 
Its mass is estimated to fall between 10 and 100 million suns, based on the brightness and energy of the X-rays. This mass range is similar to that of all the stars in the galaxy where it lives, which is in stark contrast to black holes in the centers of galaxies in the nearby universe that usually contain only about a tenth of a percent of the mass of their host galaxy's stars. Given that this ancient, supermassive black hole formed so quickly after the universe began, it cannot have been created by the merging of stellar mass black holes. Instead, another mechanism is required. Sophisticated simulations have shown that early in the history of the universe, it is possible for giant clouds of gas to have collapsed directly into very large black holes, ones with masses about 100,000 times that of the Sun. It is thought that these very massive black holes transformed into supermassive ones by a combination of merging and absorbing gas from their surroundings. While this is a single example of an ancient galaxy already hosting a supermassive black hole, it is expected that others will be found. After all, James Webb only began operations in the summer of 2022. Data like that reported in the recent article will help scientists get a better handle on just exactly what went on when the universe was in its infancy. For example, outstanding questions include, which came first? supermassive black holes or galaxies? Did the galaxy attract nearby extragalactic gas that created the conditions that allowed supermassive black holes to form? Or did the black holes form first and thereby draw in the gas that formed the stars and galaxies? How did the heat generated by gas flowing into early black holes affect star formation? And what role did dark matter play in the process? The answers to these and similar questions are slowly coming into focus. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.